Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face to shine on us. That your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen. Let us sing of this great call that we have to share the good news to all the nations.
we walk not by what we see, but by what we know and faith. I've asked Kayla to come and join Emma this morning to pray for Emma as she will be sharing here in just a few moments. Let's pray, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you calmly today and wonderful all of who you are and what you've done in our lives. We thank you that you are a God who is sovereign and you are a God who is working even when we don't see it. I pray for Emma today that you will just be with her, give her um, the peace that can only come from you as she shares with all of us. Um, just a little taste of all that you've done in us, through us, and around the world. Open our eyes to see your work, to see your hand. Help us to be thankful for all that you've done. Help us to leave here more on fire for you with um, a greater desire to go out wherever we are, whether it be around the world, at work, or just with friends and family, to let our lives be a living sacrifice for you and let our lives continue to proclaim who you are and what we say and what we do. In your name we pray. Amen.
author and perfecter of the faith that we have been seeing about this morning. Let's keep our eyes focused on him and giving him the glory with everything that we do. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face.
Isn't that dear? <laughs> she is just an absolute joy. I love this young gal. And she is a Cedarville University senior nursing major. So this is her last round the, the barn here before she graduates this May. And she had a trip in Togo that she'll share about from May the 13th, I think, to June 8th. And it will be transforming to you. And I hope that God, as he speaks through Emma, will bless you this morning and challenge you at the same time. Well, good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be able to be here this morning to share with you some of what God has done in my life and talking about Togo with you. So it's going to be really good. Um, we had some technical difficulties this morning, but it's really amazing how God just strings all these things together despite what the adversary would want for us. The Lord is going to prevail for all those things. So, to start off, again, thank you. My name is Emma. And the best way to tell you about Togo is to share the whole story. So much of what God has done in my life has impacted the trip I was able to take to Togo this summer. My hope in sharing what he has done in my life with you is that you would truly be encouraged in your walk with Jesus, whether it seems like he is leading you through pasture or a valley right now, our shepherd always prepares the way. So let's start off with where it all began. Telling you about Togo means sharing my testimony, so let's start from the beginning. First off, I'm adopted. The process of my adoption began long before I was born. My story begins as far back as you want it to reach. Before it was me, it was my mom and dad's story. It was the story of whomever my biological mother and father are. It is God's story. I am one of 13 girls who were adopted in China on November 11th in 2000. And we like to celebrate November 11th, calling it our Gotcha Day, celebrating and marking the day that our parents got us. In the map you see, the province highlighted in red is where I am from. Um, I came from an orphanage in Shangri City, in the Changxi province, and I was brought to the adoption agency in Nanchang by train. And all this took place, again, in the red over there. Geographically, I have a general idea of where I'm from. As for biological parents, though, I have very little information on that. What I do know, though, is that my biological mom, my birth mom, decided to keep me as best she could until she put me up for adoption. And that was a very real choice that she had to make. The reality of my adoption is that I was rescued from a lot of bad things and was given a chance at life. Here, I am personally cared for. I'm safe, I'm free. My physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs are attended to over and over again. China would not be a place for a girl with no parents to grow up in, and I think of this all the time. Right off the bat, if my biological mother chose to abort me, I would not be here. If I never was adopted and if I aged out of the orphanage, I may have been able to work. The wages would probably be minimal and the chance for anything better would be non-existent. Worst things could probably have come to me if I were there. Property, uh, poverty, trafficking, and prostitution takes place all over the globe, but these kinds of dangers may have come close to me, and even more so. I would not have been able to come to know Christ in the same way and with the same freedom here I was given a chance to really experience life with Christ. In focusing on adoption, I think there are a lot of comparisons to the heart of missions, and I believe that the heart of missions is something we can all share however God calls us to it. Adoption is a kind of rescue. First off, the child doesn't know that he or she needs help. The child cannot provide for themselves. They cannot protect themselves. The child cannot be saved. The child needs rescue. And what is the purpose of missions? Missions brings the gospel. The good news that Jesus died for us 
and defeated death on the cross and rose again to people who need to be rescued. It is an invitation to enter into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters of our Lord. So I would like to introduce you to some very important people in my life. This is Jim and Lori, my mom and dad. My dad is Greek and Italian, and my mom is Italian. Like I mentioned before, before I can tell you about my testimony, God has been doing a work for a long time before me to call the right people to play for his glory. So here's some more pictures. That's me and my dad. That's the baby mugshot that they took of me before I got over here. And Matthew over there on the right side, obviously squeezing me to death out of love. So what do you get when you get a Greek and Italian family to adopt a Chinese baby and then raise them in New Jersey? That's easy. You get an adopted Chinese Greek Italian Jersey kid. And if I never looked in a mirror, I would probably tell you that I look European and one day I would be known as a Nona or rather an Italian grandma. And living in New Jersey is a survival skill. The roads aren't safe, safe. the people are crazy, but I love my home in New Jersey. So growing up, growing up I went to church. I went to a Christian school and had parents who really loved the Lord. A love for the mission started in first grade when my teacher would read missionary stories to us throughout the year. The story of Adoniram Judson was one of the first missionary stories I heard, and many more were to follow through the years growing up. When I was about seven years old, I really made the decision to put my trust in Jesus as best as I knew how as a seven-year-old could confident. The next year, though, when I was about eight and in third grade, my mom got cancer, kids starting to be, started to be really mean in school, and my world seemed to really turn upside down. I turned into a sleep-deprived, emotionally hurt and anxious person. I was upset when the kids were mean. I did not understand things like why my mom was losing her hair. Everyone seemed tense for a while. My mom got better after chemotherapy, but the kids got worse. From then on, I struggled with being constantly defensive and angry for the way that I was treated. I thought only if I could be liked, or if I just had one friend, I could be so much happier. So eventually from middle school to high school, I changed schools, and with the change of school, there was a change of heart, but not without good reason. God knew the new school would be good for me in many ways. I quickly gained a friend group. I was enjoying class for the most part. My family was healthy, but man, all that didn't make my heart feel any fuller. With this change of schools, my dad, had, my dad started to leave Ligonier table talk books for me in my room. And if you know what table talk is, it's a subscription of daily devotionals for the month. I started to pick them up, and Jesus started working on my heart. I began to walk with Jesus, and as he promises, he came closer to me as I drew closer to him. At the dinner table one night, I was shaking because I knew it was time to be baptized. So I stopped my mom and dad after we ate, and I said, I want to do this. I want to be baptized. Jesus is good. And a few later, years later, the hunt for colleges began. I had a really thick binder with all, these college, uh, all this college mail that I got, but once I visited Cedarville, I knew it was the place that God was directing me towards. So Cedarville has been on my radar for a long time, actually. While I was a kid, I had family who was attending. I had two cousins. My cousin Jack, who you see there next to me, uh, was studying there for his undergraduate in pre-med. He was studying to become a general surgeon so he could serve the Lord as a missionary overseas. While Jack was at Cedarville, I was still a little kid. In the morning when my mom and I would go to school, we would pray for Jack's exams and for his rotations. At this one and only college visit to Cedarville, we took the opportunity to see Jack and his family off to language school, since they were not too far off from campus. At the college visit in 2020, we said our goodbyes for the next several years, because we would not see each other. And goodbyes are always hard that way. 
I was set on Cedarville to pursue pre-med, and Jack was set on language school in Switzerland to learn French with his family. My freshman year of college, Jack and his family had completed language school and were busy settling into their new home in Togo, Africa. A change of plans. In Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. So freshman year of college, I thought so many things. I was going to pursue pre-med and become a doctor or surgeon like my cousin. I would search for places uh, and become a missionary. It is what I wanted to do since high school, so what could go wrong with that? Well, a lot could go wrong. So see, well, yeah, I made it there at least. I quickly found out though that I am not a person who is cut out to do pre-med or go to med school. I hate chemistry, sorry for all of you who are wired that way. <laughs> I wasn't doing well in that class, so I'm really bad at math. And going to school for over a decade of your life didn't sound like fun when it came time to evaluate what I was actually getting myself into. Realizing pre-med was not for me was God working. So freshman year, while moving into the dorm, right across from my room was Michaela, and down the hallway was Jennifer. Michaela was the exact person I needed for this season in life. God gave her a sensitive spirit to listen and really see me for who I was at a crossroads. We talked about nursing and I sensed that God was instead guiding me down in a different metaphor. Michaela was the first person at Cedarville to pray with me about the decision to change majors. And now I have the privilege of trotting along with her and Jennifer for life. And here I am with you today, not as a pre-med student, rather a nursing student. That freshman year, I wrote a response paper for Dr. Miller's Old Testament class. It was in response to reading the book of Ecclesiastes, which is pretty relevant since Pastor Jason just started, uh, or just went through Ecclesiastes with us. And I would like to share this response with you today. This paper I wrote was almost like a personal promise from the Lord to me, and about how he would continue to work in college, and would at one point bring me to Togo. So I'm gonna share that with you today. The older I grow, the more I have experienced the effects of the curse. I see how little and insufficient I am. I know I have a need for Jesus. We are waiting, we are hoping, we are praying. When will the earth be removed from the shadow of the sun and be illuminated by the glory of our God? When will our bodies no longer be ravished by the pain of sin? When will we be able to bend our knees in the throne room of our God? There has been a whisper in my spirit, and the gentleness of his power has spread over me. It has become a daily message. I cannot escape it, and it will never leave me. That whisper has become a cry and the burden of my soul. The whisper says everything. I have a God that demands my everything. I have a parched soul that is burning for a closer relationship and restoration. Jesus poured out his everything for me, so what is holding me back from letting him drain every ounce of life that is in me for his glory? Nothing. Yet are we waiting with spiritually idle hands? Are we hoping but bracing ourselves for a blow that will only make us fall deeper into the arms of Jesus? Are we praying with fists full of sin? Do we shake those fists at God when he answers differently than we asked? Are we worrying too much to let him take care of us? Are we trying to reason our way into a secured life? And if yes is the answer, the issue is that our hands are not letting go of the empty security of vanity. It is dangerous to say yes to any of these, but I can say yes to all of these. Jesus has always been and always will be enough. He commands that we be strong and courageous. Fear not, do not be dismayed, because he is in control. 
He gives and takes away. He gives us everything we need to live a rich life. I truly lack nothing. I only long for the day that I wake up in the presence of my God. I'm left to surrender my everything and say yes to the whisper. In return for my meager offering of everything, I will one day experience the fullness of his presence. There is work to be done before I pass through the veil of death into eternity. I'm called to love God. I'm called to listen. I'm called to obey. I'm called to serve. Abraham had faith. The shepherds saw Jesus and they immediately went out to proclaim his name. Mary poured out her perfume. Peter hung upside down on the cross. Paul suffered, all because they believed. They heard the whisper. It became their delight. I have simply resolved that I'll save a great deal of things for eternity. Yes, there are some things that can't be done right now. The possibilities are endless. And I am limited. How much better those experiences will be, even if they are saved. The first symphony I could compose could be in heaven. The first time I place my hand on a lion's mane, a lamb will be by my side. The earth will be made new, and it's more beautiful than any paradise I have seen today. And the aroma will be sweet. My body will be new. I will not struggle with my sin nature anymore. And my heavenly Father will be waiting with me, for me with open arms. And the price was already paid. Until then, there's so much to delight in. I'm excited for the morning. Then I get to wake up in Africa. <laughs> for the next, I stay to pray for the Bible pages that run out of room on the margins and for the curious hearts that I will meet. I'm excited to see the fingerprints of God. Through it all, I want to be consumed by the fire of the Spirit. I want to live in the promises of the Lord, and I want to sing in the power of the one who conquered death. There is enough time to enjoy life. There is enough time to grow in faith. There is enough time to proclaim his name. There is enough time to unabashedly love him. There is enough time to live in for him. But there is not enough time to waste. Others need to hear the whisper. So now that I told you about, told you about all these things, let's actually move on to Togo. Cedarville School of Nursing regularly sends a medical missions team to Togo. This is not something I was aware of until maybe after a year I started nursing. The trip is especially reserved for junior and senior level nursing students. And this place is actually the exact location where my cousin Jack had settled with his family. God allowed me to be adopted into, his fam into the family he chose. He allowed me to pursue nursing. He allowed me to attend Cedarville. And he allowed me to go to Togo at the same place he prepared a way for my cousin to go. I sent in my application to go on this trip and the Lord let the door swing wide open for me and three other nursing students to go from May 5th, uh, 15th to June 8th to Togo, Africa. And you can see here, Togo is a little sliver in red on the coast of West Africa. The next two snippets give you a picture of what it looks like driving through Togo a bit. These are the more populated areas and there are a lot of villages along the way um, as well where you will see people. But first off, I'm pretty sure this might be in the capital of Lomé. And this is sort of what it looks like. This is more populated. Everybody right there drives on motos, or rather motorcycles. They like to sell all sorts of things. They've got tire stores everywhere. And here's another little clip. So this is our team. Our team served in Southern Togo at Hôpital Baptiste Bibique. Here is some information straight off of ABWB's website on HPV. Hôpital Baptiste Bibique is a missions-based hospital found in Togo, Africa in 1985. It is a 50-bed, full-service hospital. HPV sees over 18,000 outpatients and 25,000 inpatients 
with an average of 2,000 surgeries and 600 deliveries per year. The Mission Hospital is home to a nurse training program, mobile health clinics, and community health evangelism ministry. HPV also has a program called the Pan-African Association of Christian Surgeons, also known as PACS. They train people who are from Africa to serve the people of Africa as surgeons, and being part of this program is sort of like a testimony to what the Lord has done in their life, like lives. HPV is not a large hospital, but it is a hospital that puts God first in everything. Of the men's wing, women's wing, operating room, observation room, maternity ward, infection ward, and critical care rooms, you will be awoken every morning by singing of praises to the Lord from the nurse's station, which is situated right in the center of all these wards. The hospital, instead of, uh, at the hospital, instead of sitting at a computer logging data each time we cared for a patient, we found their chart and wrote down everything. Deciphering the French of the nurses and the barely recognizable English of the doctors was something to master, but we managed quite well after a week or so. On the first page of those patients' charts was a spiritual assessment that cha the chaplains filled out, making sure that the patient, the patient heard the gospel and they assessed where their heart was as their care continued. And here I heard a snapshot from our first day in the hospital to share with you. Day one. This is it. You come to the hospital, you do not know what to expect, but you discover. You see a child come, code, and die on your first day. You sit in a room with a new young family that can't afford to pay for their hospital, well, hospital bills, but much less even a meal. And they are in a room with a family who can afford care with mothers who are fed really well. A woman from Ghana then stops you because she knows English and loves God. You become friends. Then you fix a child's toy for the fourth time that day. Somebody's wound back breaks and your only replacement sounds like a generator echoing through the entire hospital. You hear a man scream and cry in pain during a procedure. And yet, each morning the aroma is strongest, the sweet incense of worship and praise to God saturates the hospital with his presence. His, he is given the day, and throughout the day, that service, the service of his people continues and his name goes forth. So here I have for you a little snippet of the singing we heard each morning before the day began. <laughs> Up on the top 
right? And um, one of the ladies that we made friends with from Ghana, who I was sort of talking about earlier, is down there on the bottom left. Uh, there are people from Peds uh, who were in the Peds ward. There was a lot of premature babies that we took care of. Um, and you saw quite a bit. Uh, at the, the last day that we were there, I brought the colorful flowers for everybody to wear, and they really enjoyed that, and they wore them throughout the entire day at the hospital, something sort of fun. But these are the Togolese people who are there 24 hours a day, all the time, and they're really joyful people. So Mobile Clinic Day was definitely one of my favorites. In Africa, there's a really great need for basic screening. One way the hospital is able to share the gospel and to serve people is by hosting these mobile clinics. In this mobile clinic that we were a part of, the team of missionaries loaded up three vans with pharmaceutical supplies, medical equipment, and some toys and Bible materials. And we were set out for our hour and a half bumpy ride up to one of the villages. And by the way, uh, there are very few traffic laws. So if you hit a chicken or a goat on the road with your car or your motorcycle, that is free dinner. So. Fortunately, that didn't happen in any of our travels. But we made it safely to the village of Langui, where we shared uh, or screened over 100 people for diabetes and hypertension. Many of the villagers were also able to meet with some of the medical team to be referred to the hospital for further care. The chapel shared the gospel, and some of the other team educated the people on the disease processes that we were focusing on. In between our screening, there was also plenty of time to play with the children, and we had some people who made the decision to follow Christ that day. Another favorite moment was listening to the chaplains at the long-term care of Rafa House, which I don't have pictures of. But one chaplain would preach in French, another would translate into Eve, and the rest of the chaplains listened or would occasionally interject into the message. What made this encounter even more personal was our ability to hear it all translated into English from our fellow nursing, senior, and friend Noah, who had learned French as a missionary kid in Togo. So the Lord gave us a little extra blessing by allowing us to hear things in English, and it wasn't just this barrier of, I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds good, keep on going. Uh, Noah's service to our team really brought the hearts of the chaplains even closer to ours. And while listening to the chaplain's preach, it really felt like we were surrounded by fierce lions who were bearing witness to the one lion of Judah, who is our precious Christ. So let's also talk about churches. Um, there's some more pictures here. Churches in Togo range from brand new and underdeveloped to very well established. In the three Sundays that I was there, I went to the least developed church a church that had been established and was still growing, and a very well-established church. My cousin Jack and I had one Sunday where we went to church together, and this was one of the newest churches we were visiting. These are still from Mobile Clinic, but just so you can see. Um, the church we went to was almost two hours away by car, the roads were terrible, and I sat in the back of the car, and I'm pretty sure that I was in the air for half of the trip, because of how bad it was. But we went up a giant mountain to the village. At any church, it's really hot because it's Africa. Uh, but for the newer uh, churches, the stick sides and tin roofs make it really difficult to sit through when you're on wooden benches. Um, and it can get kind of uncomfortable. Outside of the service, chickens will be running around. Kids will wander into the service and back out. You might hear singing from another church nearby, or you might hear the kids' lesson out back. But regardless of the setting, it's still church. The newer ones need some nurture, and certainly the faithfulness of Christ's disciples. So each Sunday, my cousin travels with his family up to this new church in the village. They begin with Sunday school in French, which is translated into the tribal language. And then you start in service, which might be another hour with translations in between. You give your tithe with your right hands in a wooden box or a basket or a pouch. You worship together and you pray together. And afterwards, house calls might be made. And then you return home. But regardless of what church you visit, the people are so warm and welcoming. They want to know you. They ask you in the middle of the service to introduce yourself. 
They're also really not hard to pick out. <laughs> and they will sing the song of welcome. They come up to you and shake your hands. So on a really fun note, I survived this really crazy hike between the border of Togo and Ghana. It felt like we were crawling up a 90 degree angled monster while it was indeed 90 degrees outside. However, all of our discomfort was forgotten when we reached the top, looking out at God's magnificent work, and we went a little further to swim at a waterfall, which we all enjoy. So that's my cousin and I on top of that mountain. I was very relieved until we had to turn around and go all the way back. I also had the privilege of scrubbing into surgery with my cousin. I had been sort of waiting for a moment like this for a very long time, and it felt very surreal to be able to be in there in the operating room, but it was really wonderful. It doesn't look like anything that we have here today. They literally have fly swatters in there because sometimes, you know, the swinging doors let things in that you don't want to come in. So it's a little bit different, but we really enjoyed I also got to spend some time with family because I hadn't seen them for quite a few years at this point. The kids got really big. They showed me all of their pets, including safe pythons, um, some chameleons and other things that were just crawling around outside, thankfully, of the house, but still contained. So with this, although my trip to Togo came to an end, the Lord still used the experience to show me new things. Because of going on this trip, I was invited to Samaritan's Purse Prescription for Renewal through Cedarville's Nursing Department. Prescription for Renewal is a medical missions conference in Orlando, Florida. They have lots of breakout sessions for things like disaster assistance response teams. They talk about their involvement with current events, mobile medical units, dental opportunities, and so much more. But guess who was one of their main speakers for this event? It was Dr. Seth Malley, the Chief Medical Officer of Hopital Baptiste Belief. That's not him there, I'll get to him in a second. But he was one of the doctors our team worked with and spent some time with while we were over in Togo. We also saw some of the visiting doctors at the same conference, and my friend Maggie and I, who had been on the trip together and went to this conference together, got to meet the man, who was standing right there, who started Hopital Baptiste Week. And if you're interested in hearing more of his testimony, I can forward uh, Pastor Nail some information as well as Dr. Malley's um, testimony that he shared at that uh, conference. It was very encouraging, very interesting, and it gives you a little more insight into what's going on over at HPV. So meeting Dr. Bob Croxy was very special. We didn't expect to see him there, but we did. He is a man who, when you look at him, you wouldn't think that he saved a kid who impaled himself by sewing them together with horse's hair and poured a packet of antibiotic powder over the wounds, or that he was in the military as a surgeon for a while, or that he would have been the one responsible for starting a hospital in northern Togo and southern Togo. So meeting him was indeed a privilege. Last, our nursing group also had the opportunity to meet and listen to Dr. David Jeremiah. If you're familiar with him, he was once president of Cedarville University, and he is uh, still very busy now elsewhere in the world serving the Lord. So after sharing with you my adventures in growing up and my adventures in Togo, I would like to end with a quote and some scripture. This quote really is a combination of two different things that I found over the years but they seem to go together really well. You can read the quote on the screen, which says, life takes us to unexpected places, love brings us home. So let my love be sincere, and let my service be fearless, O oh Lord. Life does take us to unexpected places, but what brings us home? Maybe home here is broken, but home with our Father is perfect. We know love by seeing and knowing our Lord. We see love on the cross. We know love because of who was on the cross, who was our Savior. And the grave did not hold him down. Because of the love of our God, we may also love like Jesus, and we can serve others however he calls us. What does the Spirit say? 
Do you hear the whisper right here in your heart right now? It says everything. Jesus demands our everything because he poured out everything for us. We can freely and confidently say yes to the whisper and thus be fearless in the Lord. Again, life takes us to unexpected places. Love brings us home. So let my love be sincere and let my service be fearless, O oh Lord. Also, Psalm 90 has been a really important theme, verse chapter for me the past couple of years. Uh, if you picked up one of the copies of uh, just some of the tidbits that I had for today, I have verses 12 on, but I'll share Psalm 90 with you right now. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a wash in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream. Like grass that is renewed in the morning, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by years, uh, or even by reason of strength, eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble, and we are they're soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let the work of your hand be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. There is enough time to enjoy life. There is enough time to grow in faith. There is enough time to proclaim his name. There is enough time to unabashedly love him. There is enough time to live for him. There is not enough time to waste. Others need to hear the whisper. So thank you guys for your support, your prayers, and your time today. If you have any questions, I would be happy to keep talking about Togo, Africa, and Jesus. So, if you have any questions, <coughs> open. Yes. Yes, I, I've seen on the OM that I'm in Togo, mm -hmm. which is right in this hostile. Uh, were you aware of that when you went, and did you see any of these things that would legitimate that rating that Togo is indeed? Yeah. Awesome. So in the area that I was at, which is southern Togo, a little bit closer to the capital, um, it's really not hostile. I mean, there's more Muslim groups in the north, um, and that can be a little bit dangerous. Right now, it seems to be pretty much a more peaceful time, um, but we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years with the rising of dictators and the falling of leadership and whatnot. So things might change in the next couple of years, but as of right now, it seems very peaceful. I felt very safe there, thankfully. Um, and like I said, the people are very warm and welcoming there. Yes. Yes, thank you. I will also be locatable after church if you just want to ask me questions. So thank you guys again, and Pastor Dale will come up for prayer. Thank you. gifted, as you have just experienced, just a gifted speaker, I see in her life not only a ministry in medical missions through nursing gifts, but she has a devotional writing ability that is, if you ever have her social media, she will write some incredible devotional thoughts that are articulate, scripturally accurate, and very applicable, and I just, I, I see God's hand in you 
and great things are, are in store. And just like how he's used you here, he's got many, many more things for you to magnify his glory. And so thank you so much for sharing. Let's, let's close in prayer and I'll have just a few announcements. So help us to be obedient and sensitive, like Emma has shared, of how faithful lives that reflect the glory of Jesus have such a lasting impact in this dark world. Help us all to be obedient and sensitive to your call. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.